10 years ago, Samantha Allen was a suit-wearing Mormon missionary. Since then, she has been a Daily Beast culture reporter on LGBT and sexuality issues. Her recent book, Real Queer America, LGBT Stories from the Red States, is a road trip chronicle of being a trans woman visiting LGBT communities in states that have traditionally been conservative and hostile to gay rights. Allen reports that queer life in rural and Southern America defies stereotypes, is vibrant and close-knit, unlike the gay homogenization that happens in big city culture. Samantha Allen, welcome to CrossCut Now. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I was going to say welcome to Seattle, but you live here now. Yes, for the last uh, 10 months or so, I've lived here. I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about our own cultural blind spots because I think that makes a that's an appropriate starting point for why you took on the book. Can you talk a little bit about your own blind spots when it came to queerness and red state America and and why did you choose to do the book? Why did you choose to write the book? Yeah, so you know, after the 2016 presidential election, I was living in Florida at the time. I saw a lot of anger from friends who lived in kind of coastal blue state safe havens directed toward the red states. A lot of anger about feeling like red states were holding back the country from making progress, that kind of thing. Um, and I've had amazing life experiences in red states as an openly transgender woman. I came out in Georgia. I met my wife in Indiana. I made lifelong friends in Tennessee. Um, so I, I had a real affection for LGBT communities in these places especially, and I wanted to show the rest of the country the amazing vibrancy of LGBT life in middle America. So where did you start? Where did you travel to? And did you deliberately go to certain places because you were nervous about what you might find or because you felt like it would be, they would be a little more accepting? How did you, how did you figure out your, your path? Yeah, absolutely. It, um, it was a six week long road trip. I started in Provo, Utah. Then I went to Texas, Indiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and then finally ending in Florida. Uh, it was sort of a mix of new places for me. I hadn't spent a lot of time in Texas or Mississippi before, but then also places that I was more personally familiar with. I was, I attended college briefly in Provo, Utah. I was in the closet at the time. Um, and, you know, as I said, I came out in Georgia. But I was most nervous probably to go to Mississippi, which is often ranked the worst state in the country to be LGBT. And so I was going there with sort of the express mission of finding LGBT life and community in a place that's supposed to be the most hostile to it in the country. What, um, what, what kind of car were you driving in? I'm hoping you could paint the picture of what kind of car were you driving in? You had a traveling companion. What kind of music were you listening to? What were you eating? What were you finding? What was the fun stuff that you were doing while you were taking this journey? Uh, we were making up songs about uh, the places that we were driving through. We rented a seven-seat SUV because that's what the, uh, the airport at Texas had on hand for us. So it was me and my road trip companion, Billy, who's a friend of my wife's, um, driving this ridiculous seven-seat SUV all around the country. We subsisted largely off of fast food, as one does on road trips. And was it, uh, what, what were the, the, the various emotions that you were feeling as you were experiencing? Yeah, it was, um, it was, this was the summer of 2017 and a very interesting time to be doing this road trip. Uh, you know, when I was in Texas, the Texas state legislature was considering passing a bathroom bill that was gonna restrict restroom usage by birth certificate gender marker. Around that same time, uh, President Trump tweeted that he intended to ban transgender people from military service. And then the riots in Charlottesville um, also happened while I was on the trip. So it was this real turbulent mix of emotions. The LGBT communities that, that I became enmeshed in while writing the trip left me feeling really hopeful and optimistic about the future, even as there were these kind of more disheartening national level stories happening. Can you talk to me a little bit about what it was like to come out? Yeah, so I uh, was raised in the Mormon church. The Mormon church has been going uh, through a slow evolution on LGBT issues, but still isn't really fully accepting of LGBT folks. And certainly at the time that I was, you know, coming out exploring my identity, uh, wasn't really a safe place to be openly transgender. Um, so I was uh, attending Brigham Young University, which is owned by the Mormon Church, at the time that I really started coming to terms with the fact that, that I might be transgender. 
um, and I had to leave the school because I needed to leave the church in order to go through that personal journey. And, and that was hard. It was hard coming out to family. It was hard coming out to my parents, especially, who are both believing, active members of the church. But we've slowly sort of repaired our relationship over the last five, ten years, and um, it got into a much better place. And, you know, while writing the book, I, I met a lot of LGBT folks now who were staying in the Mormon church and saying, we want to change the church from within. And they feel like they have the support system and network now to be able to do that. So what were the revelations and what were the, were there moments when you were afraid or when you were, when you encountered um, notions of not being accepted? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I never felt personally afraid on, on the trip. Um, I think a lot of that is a function of my privileges as a white transgender woman. You know, driving around the country, you see all sorts of Confederate flags, Confederate memorabilia, and a road trip might not be as, as safe or as relaxing an experience for a person of color as it was for me necessarily. Um, but I was, I was really surprised, even having had the experiences that I've already had in red states, I was surprised by the things that I found. So for instance, in Provo, Utah, where I was so closeted and afraid and terrified to be out, um, the last time I was in Provo before writing the book was 2007. So I go, I go back 10 years later, and there's an LGBT youth and family center right across the street from the Mormon temple in mm. Provo, Utah. And it was surreal. I felt like Alice through the looking glass, right. like sitting in this youth center with other like trans kids playing card games, making cookies, like right across the street from the temple that to me once was associated with so much fear and shame. Do you think um, when it comes to civil rights that trans rights is, is sort of the last issue that needs to be addressed? Yeah. I I'd hesitate to call it uh, the last issue. There's certainly all sorts of pressing civil rights issues that remain, but it, it's certainly at the forefront right now. Um, and it's an interesting moment when, you know, the federal, the federal government right now is trying to ban trans people from what has been our largest employer in the country, the U.S. military. Um, we live in a time where the White House is demonstrating a tremendous hostility towards trans rights. Um, and because the trans community is so small, we really need more allies to, to stick up for us, to fight for us with the same level of fervor that people fought for things like marriage equality in 2015. The, uh, what's striking about your book, or, or forgive me, it's, it struck me, was that you talk about um, feeling, it, I think, more comfortable being queer in red states than in more progressive areas. So I'm wondering what is it like to live now here in Seattle? Yeah, I don't really feel like my full LGBT self in Seattle. I get a little wary when there's such a large and visible LGBT population. I feel like people can get kind of lulled into a bit of complacency or that kind of thing. And that's part of why I prefer to be um, out as LGBT in a place like Atlanta or, or Florida. Is folks really know what the stakes are. They, they live with those stakes every day. We see in those states anti-LGBT legislation getting proposed posed every single year and so people know that they have to kind of stay alert and stay on top of those issues and sometimes I worry in a place like Seattle or New York that people can kind of I don't know start to sleep on crucial rights issues a little bit. What do you think folks um, in the gay community and the LGBT community um, don't understand about the LGBT community in these in, in rural areas in in the red states. Yeah, I think on on the most basic level, one that they're that they're there. Um, there's sort of an assumption, I think, sometimes that everyone has gotten out to a coastal city, and in fact, a large number of LGBT folks have stayed in these places or have moved back uh, in some cases. And I, I met just countless LGBT folks on the trip who are in that situation. And then I think. Um, Gosh, there, there's not enough attention paid to the work that they've been doing uh, across the country. You can go to any state in this country and find some little LGBT hotspot where there's a, you know, a thriving LGBT center or a support group that sprouted up in the last five years. So I think it's this just like lots of little dots all across the country that have been springing up. I think 
uh, one of the phrases that I see a lot, um, and you write in your book, is uh, that the notion of queer America or, or queerness isn't necessarily a, 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 a gay boy moving on a one-way ticket to New York, but is a... Yeah, a, a queer girl in Tennessee who stays put, right? Like, I, uh, something like nearly four million LGBT Americans live in the South alone. Um, so, and we've seen more and more reporting, more and more quality demographic statistics about that. And folks are always really surprised to hear that. Um, but LGBT folks have built uh, networks of support, even in places that seem hostile. Is there homogenization that happens in, in urban areas that you're afraid of? Yeah, I would say that in kind of large blue state megalopolises, um, LGBT life can be really nightlife focused or, or there can be, uh, gosh, I just enjoy LGBT life more in a place where there's just a little more warmth, I guess. You know, I think you go to a place like uh, you know, New York City, for instance, and there there is a, a different kind of gay bar for like all sorts of people and everyone just kind of splits off and the white gay men go here and the, the black lesbians go to this bar and that kind of thing. Everybody just kind of branches off and I think it's a shame because when you go to a place like Jackson, Mississippi, where there's only one LGBT nightclub in town, everyone has to go to the same nightclub and you see more, uh, more diverse group of folks there. Do you think Buttigieg could be a transformative candidate or is a transformative candidate and yeah I mean I see sort of two sides of that question on the one hand I've seen some frustration of like y yes of course the first you know seemingly viable gay presidential candidate is like a white married gay Christian man but on the other hand and I, I think I have more of this feeling um, I think it's so important to have a figure who really challenges the conversation around LGBT versus religion in this country. And that's been, for me, the most gratifying thing to watch. And I think he's already changed our public discourse around you know, religious freedom versus LGBT rights in this country by just simply positing the fact of, here I am, I'm a gay Episcopalian, and you have to deal with it. You might have already a answered this, but... Uh, what else do you? What else are you hungry to see? What is it that that you just can't wait? You just you just dream of, and you just hope that you get to witness in your lifetime. Gosh, I I hope I I hope I live to see um, not just full LGBT cultural acceptance because I think that's coming sooner than any of us know, but full legal acceptance. You know, I think one of the things the Trump administration has been very successful at doing over the last few years has been appointing anti-LGBT judges to federal courts, um, and that's going to stymie legal progress. I think we're going to hit this really awkward point soon where cultural acceptance is, is sort of more or less there, but legal acceptance is going to lag way behind, and that's going to be a painful difficult period. Thank you very much. Samantha Allen, it was really great to meet you. Thank you. It was lovely.